today on Ag News Daily. Autonomy is is really best at uh, replacing or augmenting very repetitious, repeatable uh, field operations, right? And um, depending on your level of specificity, uh, GPS accuracy, for instance, or GNSS accuracy needed for that particular operation, uh, there's things we can do today and things that we can't do today. And there's things that are just around the corner on our roadmap. Well, welcome back to the weekly edition of the Ag News Daily Show. And I almost feel like I should be saying that to you, Delaney. Yes, well, thank you, Tanner. I miss, I'm sure you missed me in the episode. Oh, you almost said that you missed me. No, you I, you, you almost said it, but you didn't. I did. Well, yes, we are happy to have you back. I'm sure our listeners feel the same way. Did you enjoy your trip? I did. I had a couple of trips lined up back to back, so we'll... Maybe get into it later. There you go. We're great, and uh, it's great to have you back. We did see, however, hail up to 2.5 inches in diameter and wind gusts nearly 100 miles per hour that accompanied some of the storms that hit Iowa on Monday of this week. Places across northern Illinois, southern Wisconsin, and northern Indiana also reported large hail and severe winds as those storms advanced east Monday night and into Tuesday morning. The storms that hit Iowa, Wisconsin, Indiana, and Illinois on Monday can be classified as a derecho. A derecho is a fast-moving windstorm where the wind damage must extend more than 240 miles and wind gusts in the damaged path must be at least 58 miles per hour. This derecho left thousands of people without power by Tuesday morning while causing extensive tree damage and even damage to other buildings. Now as we look into the future forecast... A cooler and drier forecast for most of the U.S. Corn Belt is to be expected. A front carried showers and thunderstorms through the Midwest this week, but it will be dry behind it for a few days. Temperatures are much more mild than typical for this time of year. An upper-level low is settling off the west this week. Through next week may bring uh, some showers into the region through next week, but models are mixed on the coverage and the intensity, but there should be some rainfall, though. Some areas in the southeast that are still struggling with soil moisture and drought may not get much rain either, while some areas that are wet in the northwest are going to see some favorable dryness heading their direction. So a lot to unpack there, Delania, but it looks like a variable weather forecast across the U.S. Yes, Tanner, and we'll, I'm sure, hit on that a little bit more here as we touch on markets. But as we look at crop progress for the week, corn and soybean condition ratings held steady over the past week. While there are certainly pockets that have some concerns, overall crop development is favorable in much of the Midwest and the Plains. According to the USDA, 68 percent of the U.S. corn is rated good to excellent, with 41 percent of the crop silking and 8 percent at the dough stage both ahead of the respective five-year averages. 68% of soybeans are good to excellent, with 51% blooming, and 18 at the pod setting stage, actually faster than the five-year average. And finally, winter wheat. 71% of that is harvested, compared to 62% normally in mid-July, with 77 of the spring wheat crop in good to excellent shape, up 2%, and 76% of that crop is headed. So, Certainly coming back after a couple of weeks gone, Tanner, I was shocked to see how quickly the corn had grown and starting to see some tasseling as well. That's right. Well, Tanner, one of the trips I had this week was heading to Washington, D.C. for the National Corn Grower Association's annual Corn Congress. And new markets are certainly on the minds of many producers as we look to new potential markets for U.S. corn. Staff is certainly top of mind. It was a discussion we had this week in D.C. And earlier this week, Reuters reported that the production capacity of sustainable aviation fuel in the U.S. could jump by 1,400% in 2024 if all the capacity additions come online this year. The Energy Information Administration anticipates that the domestic SAF and biofuel production markets will increase by about 50% this year. Of course, there are still Many barriers ahead for growers for SAF, as you must meet specific carbon intensity scoring requirements that will go into place under the new GREET model January 1st of 2025. But investments in the SAF market have increased due to the EPA's renewable fuel standard, federal tax credits, and other programs incentivizing the growth of this market 
And it's certainly top of mind for many corn growers, Tanner, as we look to the year ahead. Yeah, looking to increase demand in any way that we possibly can. And we did get some news, though, for potential demand increase, but there's been a total of eight requests to reconsider the pipeline permit that was approved by the Iowa Utilities Commission this past week. Ahead of their procedural deadline that was coming up on Monday, the commission last month approved a proposal by Summit Carbon Solutions to construct about 690 miles of pipe in Iowa to transport captured carbon dioxide from ethanol plants. The company has already sought to expand its footprint by more than 300 miles to connect more of these facilities. The opposition to the use of eminent domain is which in which Summit would be able to force unwilling landowners to host its pipeline network, is the common thread amongst those objections. The commission used a self-designed balancing test that considered a number of factors to determine whether the project benefits the public. That test overwhelmingly favored the permit for Summit, and those that were opposed to the project said that those conclusions were flawed. Delaney, Summit additionally wants to lay about 2,500 miles of pipe in five states to transport the greenhouse gas to North Dakota for underground storage. It has not yet been been able to obtain those permits in North and South Dakota, which is a requirement for the company to start their construction in Iowa. It seems like the latest request filed, Delaney, could be just a precursor to lawsuits down the road. Yeah, a lot of of question marks still around those, but some more question marks around... The path forward here for avian influenza as the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reported the first cases of highly pathogenic avian influenza in poultry workers. Now, since 2022, officials have stated that at least five people in Colorado have tested positive for the virus after depopulating birds at a poultry facility experiencing an outbreak. The CDC indicates that high heat during the process was likely a contributing factor and emphasizes that the risk to the general public still remains low. Earlier this month, a dairy farm worker in Colorado also tested positive for H5N1, making this the fourth dairy farm worker confirmed to have the virus this year. The response team is currently investigating the outbreak going on in Colorado, but additionally in Oklahoma, they've recently reported a positive case of highly pathogenic avian influenza in dairy cattle, now totaling 13 states to do so. The Oklahoma Department of Agriculture states that the confirmed case from a sample collected in April, but it was submitted to the USDA in July, so starting to play some catch-up there, officials noted that the herd has fully recovered since then, and they're advocating for strong biosecurity practices, including the use of personal protective equipment by workers, Tanner. Yeah, it seems like we continue to get more and more information out of those cases. But in other avian influenza-related news, Iowa State University has published a new report this month offering potential explanation for how cattle, and more specifically the milk, is being infected. The study published by ISU College of Vet Medicine found that the bovine mammon how do you say that? Mammary Delary. gland. The mammary. bovine mammary gland. Man, those <laughs> tissues ha- are the receptors for the virus, and they may be a potential entry point for the virus to enter the cow's mammary glands. The Iowa Secretary of Ag, Mike Nag, said during last week that the longitudinal studies are also being conducted on farms to test every single animal housed there in order to track how the virus moves and determine how it exits the herd. So a big step forward there into at least the tracking and early detection. But it's time for our interview for this week. Let's get into a great one today. Well, listeners, it's time for one of our great interviews. And uh, we're looking to get caught up with Savanta. We're excited to have some guests in studio. Last time we did this, it was virtual. Mm -hmm. So uh, fantastic to have them back. Welcome to Studio 205. Appreciate you having us. Thank you. Before we jump Thank into you. what you guys have for updates, why don't you introduce yourself and remind our listeners who you are and what your role is with the company? Sure. Okay, I'll start. Yeah, I'll start. Uh, my name is Craig Rupp. I'm the founder and CEO of Sabanto. Uh, grew up in Northwest Iowa on a farm and uh, decided that I want to take autonomy mm-hmm. in agriculture. So I started the company back in 2018. Wow. And I'm Mike Burdick. I'm the sales director at Savanto. Um, originally from Michigan. Uh, I'm a transplant here in Iowa. Um, came out for school uh, in Ames and loved it so much uh, you couldn't get rid of me. 
you know, it happens to a lot of people mm-hmm. we've, uh, we've come to notice, but thanks for coming back. So let's first get sure. our listeners that aren't aware of what Sabanto does a refresher on what you've been up to. Sure. So Sabanto, um, just celebrated its five year anniversary back in October. I believe it was, if I'm not mistaken, um, we've developed and brought to market over the last 12 or 18 months, a retro autonomy kit, um, color agnostic um, in the 100 to uh, roughly the 240 horsepower range. Um, as I mentioned, we're color agnostic. Um, the We're leaving the engine and transmission business to the OEMs, right? So uh, over the last, again, eight, 12 to 18 months, we've gone out and spoken to a lot of folks in various industries and what we've heard from them is conceptually uh, what we're bringing to market is something that a lot of folks have been dying for. You know, the, there's a fairly substantial labor issue uh, in the ag market, as, as most of us know, uh, and that's what we're attempting to solve. Do more with less. And Craig, you know, you think about 2018, that was really kind of when autonomy and agriculture was just at the forefront. And so you've really gotten to see over the last five years the transformation and that starting adoption of autonomy in the space when you started in 2018 compared to where we are today you know what was your perspective and how's that changed as farmers and oems have become more accepting of that technology yeah in 2018 uh so i went out in actually the spring of 2019 and it's more of a proof of concept and uh, i was working with farmers to try to understand as just just how they will adopt autonomy into their operation um it's a new technology uh, there is change on the operator or the the uh, farming operation side to adopt autonomy. It's not going to be just you drop it in and, and auto magically, uh, you know, your operation is running much right. more productively. There is some change management on the operation side. And we're starting to deploy more and more systems throughout the U.S. Uh, I just got back from Georgia. We have... Uh, you know, over 10 systems running in an operation, and we're working with them to try to further optimize and keep these things running longer hours. Mm-hmm. Craig and I always talk that, you know, uh, and and with our customers, we also speak to them about, you know, if you're trying to operate uh, in a traditional manner, the same way you would with a butt in the seat, for instance, uh, as the, as you would without a butt in the seat, you're really kind of missing the boat. There's some things operationally that, that you need to plan for and manage um, on the on the front end uh, to really get the most out of the system. But once those things are dialed in, you know, we're seeing uh, efficiencies upwards of the 50% range. Hmm. Wow. Really? And that's mm-hmm. the way that one of these systems can pay for itself very quickly. And I'm sure that's Absolutely. part of your strategy. But what, what are some of the most common applications that you're seeing your technology being used for right now? Right now, we're, we're primarily focused on the sod business, and there's a, a number of reasons for that. Um, number one uh, is just the unit economics behind it. So the sod business is, is a little bit of a niche business, but uh, you know, autonomy is, is massively impactful. And what I mean by that is, is you take a, a corn and soybean grower here in the I states where we spend, you know, where we live and, and breathe, uh, say a thousand acre grower might travel over those acres, you know, eight or 10 times a year, uh, for various reasons. So you've got roughly 10,000 acres of travel, right? You apply a butt to the seat in that scenario. And then, you know, it's X labor costs associated with, with those, uh, uh, traveled acres. You take a look at the sod business, especially down in the Southeast or on the West coast, they're traveling over those acres two or three times a week maybe even four or five times a week, depending on their practices, right? They're maybe doing two or three mows with a rolling application and an aggravation uh, um, application. That same 1,000-acre grower is, you know, north of 150,000 acres of travel easy. And so you apply the butt to seat um, right. to those economics, and, and, you know, the value drivers are are massive. So. I would say about 95% of our business today is sod focused. Uh, we're branching out um, pretty quickly into some other adjacent areas. Um, but again, that's that's kind of the primary focus at the moment. And then the one thing I w- might add as well is we're doing a, quite a lot of field operations that are um, like really, really mundane. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I'll give you an example. In the sod industry, uh, they, they uh, some customers uh, roto-till. 
uh, some aerate, and some use this uh, device called a Warlord. And, uh, you know, if you can imagine, it's an 8-foot implement, and they run one mile an hour. And so they're, they're doing less than one acre an hour, and you put that on a 40-acre field, it takes forever. Yeah. And these systems run, uh, they're running 20-hour days easily. Yeah, that uh, I could see being a safer option than having mm-hmm. an employee in the seat because if I did that for an eight-hour day, mm-hmm. I might fall asleep. No doubt. You know, the, it, some of these operations that Craig's mentioning are really rough on the operator as well. You know, they can rattle some teeth out of out of your head uh, in some of these applications. So, you know, from... Uh, you know, a safety uh, aspect, there's certainly some advantages there. Um, But also from an efficiency standpoint, you know, nothing against the best human operator out there, right? But, you know, I think uh, we've done some work and and gone through some surveying with some of our customers. And we think the average overlap from a mow, just in a pure mowing perspective is 15 to 18% overlap on a pass to pass basis. Right. We can dial our system into, you know, three inches of overlap, right? And so you're finishing a field, a very simple operation. You're finishing a field a half an hour to an hour earlier than you had, you know, potentially in the past. And again, that's nothing against a human operator, but mowing with the Internet is is generally, you know, just a little bit more, um, you know, direct. uh, Until you find a wet spot. (laughs) Yes, we've accounted for some of those, some of those issues as well. So the... The system does have some intricacies, so you can operate it very, very similarly to how um, a human would. But again, the work, good data in, good data out, yep. right? So if you, if, if our customers and, and prospective customers take some time to really understand how autonomy uh, can best be optimized in their operation, they can really get out ahead of that. You know, so for instance, when we run a demo, we generally roll across the farm gate, throw a uh, roll a tractor off a trailer, and strike a, a field boundary. Right? The more a- something as simple as the more accurate that field boundary is, the more usable it is in the future. Right? And so when you've got ten fields uh, and ten mission uh, coverage maps associated with those ten fields, the more dialed in you get up front, mm-hmm. the better off they're going to work for it in the long run. I'm just so curious, too, because I feel like the sod industry is something I have learned more about over the last Mm -hmm. few years. And it's really, like you mentioned, Mike, such a niche space to be in. Sod farming is very labor intensive. There's lots of Mm -hmm. lots of it that goes into it. Not that corn and soybean farming isn't hard, but there's maybe more that goes into it. You know, as you think about Sabanto's journey, how did you guys find that specific space within the sod industry to recognize like, hey, this is a big need for us. Because I would say a lot of the other autonomous focused companies maybe are focused more on conventional or specialty crops. So how did sod get on your radar? I'll let you handle that one, I think. Yeah. Um, we went out with an autonomous tractor and there was this, this operation in Kansas that uh, bought a system and... Uh, I went down there for the installation. I wanted to see just, you know, what type of operation this was and what they're going to use this tractor for. And it turned out to be a sod operation. And I've driven by these sod farms, and they're absolutely, I mean, it's the, it's it's this just 40-acre lawn that is just pristine. Gorgeous. Mm-hmm. It's absolutely gorgeous. gorgeous. And it was the sod shop in Lawrence, Kansas, and... I got to understand just exactly the field operations that these people are performing. And it turns out, you know, they'll do, you know, they'll mow this every two to three days. And then I started going into, you know, looking at the numbers of these sod farms and they're all over. And it, it's, it, you know, it is, it, it is a specialty crop, but that they're doing field operations all over. And I'll give you an example. We went down to Georgia, um, there's a 15,000 acre sod farm, which I mean that if that was a row crop, that'd be a mm-hmm. pretty good, uh, yeah, pretty good operation size, and uh, they're spread across 18 operations, uh, 15,000 acres. They mow over a million acres a year. Wow. Mm-hmm. And I, I got to thinking, where would I find a row crop farmer that covers a million acres? Right. And 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 if you're a startup and you're developing new technology. You know, 
the best way to get traction is to be out in the field and get hours and get acres underneath your belt because that's how you fix the uh you know any problems and and improve your product mm-hmm. is by using it you can sit in the cube and, right. and and think about just ways to improve your technology but until you get on a farm and you get into an operation then you really learn as to what it's going to take the the best thing you know from an engineering standpoint is trial and error right and not necessarily trial and error in a vacuum as craig mentioned you know sitting at the bench or or in front of a computer running simulations get it out with customers potential even potential Mm -hmm. customers uh friendly or unfriendly you know uh uh, constructive criticism is a good thing in our business right Mm -hmm. so and we've gone through plenty of it so and it's and it's uh, forced us to evolve the product in a fairly short amount of time um, clearly, we're an Iowa and Illinois-based uh, organization. Most of us in the organization have a, row, uh, a corn and soybean traditional row crop background. We've had to pick up the sod business in about the last year. Mm-hmm. And the only way for us to – or the the way we did it and likely the best way to understand the sod business is to hear it from the horse's mouth, right? Yeah. So – so as um, we do look at corn and soybeans and row mm-hmm. crop, majority of our listeners also have the mm-hmm. same background. What's the next application that we can see it being adopted into that sector? So we are currently very, very capable of tillage uh, today, right? So autonomy is is really best at uh, replacing or augmenting very repetitious, repeatable uh, field operations, right? And um, depending on your level of specificity, uh, GPS accuracy, for instance, or GNSS accuracy needed for that particular operation, uh, there's things we can do today and things that we can't do today, and there's things that are just around the corner on our roadmap. So today, from a uh, you know traditional row crop background uh, standpoint, um, tillage is really where we're living today, and we are doing that today. Um, I mentioned that we're on roughly the 100 horse to, you know, the fence 700, the uh, roughly in the mid 200 uh, horse range. A lot of guys in the corn and soybean um, realm are not running tillage with a 100 horse power tractor. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean they can't, but maybe they're not set up for, right. f- for instance, because they don't have an implement that a uh, tillage implement that a 100 horse uh, tractor can pull. If they're willing to augment their operation, um, you know, by picking up a new piece of equipment, slapping an autonomy kit on um, a smaller platform tractor, they're running tillage today. And there are some things that we may or may not get into today that that, uh, are just around the pipe for, for row crop. I think we should tease that a little bit. I think we should. I mean, we don't have a lot of time left, but sure. why don't we get a couple of those items out, and then that gives us a good thing to follow up with, or for our listeners to reach out to you and ask as well. So I, I think, you know, just around the corner, probably in 2025, there are some things I mentioned um, uh, from an autonomy standpoint that you got to get out of the way first before you can really start pulling uh, maybe some more complicated implements. Um, increased GNSS accuracy. We're capable of that today. Um, the system is designed and built uh, ready for that. Um, so effectively, we just enhanced the subscription base that we use for GNSS, and we're dialed in uh, at one centimeter. Um, beyond that, uh, there are some enhanced um, uh, hardware components, such as a uh, electric steering kit that we're going to adopt into some of the models that we're working on today that'll come out uh, September 1 is the the due date for the John Deere 6 series, for instance. Um, And that electric motor will allow us to work with one of our other partners from a display standpoint. Um, So we'll not only be able to connect to and operate the system via uh, Mission Control, uh, which is our platform, but you'll be able to operate and implement potentially um, behind the tractor via a partner display. Mm-hmm. No, there is a lot coming down the pipeline. It's kind of exciting. It's fun, like I said, to have you guys in studio. But if our listeners want to reach out to you and learn more, Craig, how do they do that? Uh, they can go to our website at um, sabantoag.com or they can uh, hit us up on the email sales at sabantoag.com. Of okay. course, we've got all the socials as well. That's awesome. Anything else you want to add before we close out today? I appreciate you having us. Yeah, I appreciate having us. Awesome. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much.
My last headline for the day, Delaney, is a new beige book that was issued out of the Federal Reserve Board just last week, noted a lot of questions that come to 2024's farm income. The beige book is released eight times a year and is a compilation of the 12 regional Fed bank reports and their regional economic conditions. The regional Fed banks in Chicago and Minneapolis said that farm income outlook was continued to weaken and looking at that to continue to be substantially in the recent weeks, while the Kansas City Fed said that their ag conditions for their district had faced headwinds all year from weak crop prices. When do we think interest rate cuts are going to come, Delaney? We don't know. It didn't say in the Beige Book. The Beige Book did little to acknowledge the million-dollar question, but a handful of Federal Reserve officials have indicated a rate cut may soon be possible, if, but probably highly unlikely to be before their September board meeting. U.S. inflation did fall to 3% in June, the lowest level in more than three years, and well on track to hit the Fed's target of 2%. So once we get to that target, Delaney, it'll be interesting to see if they cut the rates. It certainly will, Tanner. But transitioning our attention to the commodity markets, USDA, of course, threw some curved balls at the corn market last week in the July WASD when they provided some new fodder for the bulls short term as they cut old crop corn stocks and increased demand. However, last week's bullish sentiment for corn and early wheat gains were short-lived as the market pulled back to end the week. After a turnaround Tuesday, markets seemed to be doing their best to cover some short positions in the corn market, but lackluster export sales numbers on Thursday and weather pressure continue to keep a lid on markets this week. Heading into Friday's trade, December corn is down nine and three quarters cents on the week. And we'll see how today's trading session finishes things up. But the bright spot certainly this week was Minneapolis spring wheat, as traders are beginning to focus on covering their short positions ahead of any potential supply risks. We've seen hot and dry weather in the northern plains, an ongoing drought and Canadian wildfires, and drought concerns in the Black Sea as well, really all adding up now to some potential supply concerns for that wheat market, Tanner. But... uh, Good to be back in the seat, catching up with you, catching up with all of our listeners. Yeah, it was some great headlines, too, to come back to. Great news. Uh, We didn't talk about anything related to the uh, Republican National Convention or what happened uh, to President Trump the prior week as well. But uh, you guys can get all that news elsewhere. We're focusing directly on ag topics here on Ag News Daily. That's right. We're going to have some more great Topics and conversations coming up on the podcast next week, Tanner, but they can also follow along with us on social media. Find us on Facebook, X, Instagram, and TikTok to get some extra content if you're missing us in between the days. But what do you say with that, Tanner? We let the people go. Let's let them go. 